I'm Matthew. I'm a third year PhD student at Carnegie Mellon. I work with Heather Miller. Um, unfortunately, Heather couldn't be here today, so you'll have to settle for just me. Um, but I'm going to be talking about how to make, oops, and talk about how to make web apps collaborative with composable CRDTs. So first things first, when I say collaborative apps, I'm thinking of programs like these. You know, Google Docs is probably the classic example, but then we've got all sorts of other things, you know, shared notepads, shared whiteboards. Um, and I broadly, uh, or more specifically, I consider these to be basically any app where you have a small group of users working together to edit some shared state. Okay, and these apps are great, right? We use these all the time. They're especially good for remote work and stuff like that. Um, so let's say, inspired by this greatness, you want to make your own collaborative apps. And in particular, let's say that you have an app that's not collaborative yet, but you want to add collaboration. So here's our running example. It's a simple recipe book app. You've got your list of recipes on the left. You can click on a recipe to view its ingredients and edit them. And this is a really simple app. It's like 200 lines of TypeScript plus some HTML and CSS. I got it off of CodePen and then added a few more features. So yeah, it's a, it's a static app. It just runs in the user's browser. There's no servers or anything fancy. And it's the kind of thing that you could probably make in a weekend, just put on your personal website. Can I move this at all? This is okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, anyway, so this is something you could probably make in like a weekend, put it on your personal website, and just forget about it. Okay? But now we want to add collaboration. How are we going to go about that? Well, you're probably thinking we're going to need some full stack architecture, right? We're going to rent some servers in the cloud, set up sync protocols, user accounts, security. We're going to need some money to run the servers, especially if it becomes really popular. You know, you know if you've got a million users, it's going to be a decent amount of money. Maybe you'll need a company to manage all that. Um, and basically, at this point, you're thinking of quitting your job and starting a startup, all just to add collaboration to this app. That's a lot different from what we started with in the single user case, where you could just make it in a weekend, put it up, and forget about it. Okay. So here's sort of summary. You know, compared to a single user app, it's a lot harder to develop and deploy. And then there's downsides from the user's perspective too, right? They lose the privacy of their data. For all you know, you might just be taking all their secret family recipes and you're going to publish them in a book somewhere. Um, there is no guarantee of longevity for their data or the app itself once it's in the cloud. It's not going to work offline, but of course it's collaborative. Also, from the perspective of open source, I'm a big fan of the open source movement, but when you have a collaborative app, even if the source code is public, it's not really like someone can just download the source, make a little change, and then republish it with the same quality as the original, right? Because if you want to republish it, you're going to go have to go through all this trouble of making all this, or renting all the servers again. But we're ambitious. We'd like to get all the green check marks. We want all the good properties of single user collaborative apps, but without the, um, but while also getting collaboration. Yes, yeah, sorry. All the good properties of single user non collaborative apps, but we also want to add collaboration. The question is what technology can we use to make this possible? Or is this even possible? Um, as you can probably guess, I wouldn't be here if I didn't think this was possible. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how I think we can do it. So the core idea comes out of the work of Martin Kletman and his collaborators at True Data and you can switch. If you, if you don't know Martin, he's a researcher at Cambridge University. I was lucky to work with him. Uh, he was one of my info advisors when I was in Cambridge three years ago. Uh, and the basic idea that came out of this line of work is that instead of making collaborative apps centered around a server, where the server is the single point of truth and the clients are just single or thin clients, instead we are going to store our app state in client-side, conflict-free, replicated data types, or CRDTs, and then we're gonna let those do all the work of collaboration. So what this looks like is if you have, you know, one of our ingredients, the ingredient carrot, then if grandma here changes the ingredient, then her own browser is going to call text.insert40, where text, instead of a normal string, it's now going to be a text CRDT. So what text does under the hood when this change happens, it's going to send messages to everyone else looking at the same recipe. And this message basically encodes the, effect, encodes the fact that she's inserted the letter O. Everyone else, once they get these messages, their own copy of the text string will update to express it. So in that way, we get collaboration. And the neat properties of CRDTs, well, there's a lot of neat things about them, but in particular, 
The first thing is that each client CRDT is considered a true copy of the collaborative state. So each client has a true copy of the recipe book. It's not like they're just listening to some sorter's true copy. And they can use this always. So for ex in particular, it'll still work offline and then you can sync up changes with everyone else later. Um, yeah, and more generally, clients can sync up with each other whenever and however. As long as two clients can contact each other and send messages, they can collaborate. Okay. Um, yeah, so then the particular thing I want to talk about today is a new library called Collabs that we just released on NPM, and it's a TypeScript library that provides these CRDTs. Or I actually, I like the more, what I think about is a more general term of collaborative data structures, just because there's things that could work that aren't generally considered CRDTs, um, like certain operational transform part types. Uh, but anyway, I'll probably use these terms sort of interchangeably. And let's see. Yeah, so then what this library gives you is it gives you collaborative versions of ordinary data types that you can use in the browser. Like instead of using a string, you'll use a collaborative text. And then if you change this type on one, client, it'll all automatically show up on everyone else's clients do. And likewise, you know, maps, arrays, uh, all sorts of data types. Okay, so then when you're using collabs, you end up adopting the following architecture. So at the top of your network stack, you have your app's front end. So like that, that single user app I showed you before, the, sorry, the recipe book app I showed you before. And then Internally, instead of using normal data structures to store the state, you'll use the collaborative data structures from collabs, okay? And then to, in order to work these, you need a way to actually contact other users, so you have to provide a network, and this network has to guarantee broadcast messaging. Basically, when one user sends a message, everyone else should receive it eventually, but it doesn't really matter how. In particular, there's no requirements that the messages are delivered in order or that they're delivered within a certain amount of time. It can take you know, days, even a year if you wanted. And the collaborative data structures will still work. And they'll still converge to the same collaborative state. Um, technically, they're eventually consistent. So what this lax network requirement lets you do is it lets you use basically any network you can think of to connect the collaborators together. It doesn't just have to be your own app's server. That's some monolithic, monolithic platform. So in particular, you can still use a server if you want, but it doesn't have to be a specific thing. It can be some generic messaging server that can work for all sorts of apps, which means you don't have to deploy it yourself. Someone else can do it for you. Um, you could also use something cooler. You could use you know, WebRTC, IPFS. You could use some group, chats, group chat protocol like Matrix, um, sneaker net, you know, send USB sticks in the mail. And the other cool thing is that you can change out your network at any time. Like maybe you decide the server you're currently using isn't good enough or it goes away or it costs too much or whatever. You can just switch your conversation over to a different one. As long as you make sure not to lose any messages in transit, you'll be okay. And the clients will continue having the true copies of the state. So I think that can help to prevent a lot of the ills around vendor lock-in and things like this. Okay. So of course, using our library isn't completely trivial. You'll still have to do some stuff to your single user app to make it collaborative. So the first step is to replace its state with collabs versions of each type. So for example, in the single user version, we have this class ingredient, which describes a, a single ingredient, like you know, three cups of flour. It has a text string. Well, we just convert that into a collaborative text. The amount is a number. We convert it into this fancy number that I'll mention later. The units we turn into a last writer wins register. Um, that just means that you know if two people try to change the units at the same time, it'll just pick one based on wall clock time. Okay, and there's a table in the docs that helps you with this conversion, and we have to do this to a few classes to do some boilerplate and then connect things up to the actual GUI, and then once that's done, you can just publish your app as static files on the web. You don't have to launch a bunch of cloud servers or anything like that. Um, and in fact, for the demos I'm going to show. I just push the files to a public GitHub repo because that was the easiest thing I could figure out. Okay, so that's how to make the app collaborative. And, oh yes, yeah, so the total effort is we started with 211 lines of TypeScript. We end up with about 500. Uh, that's kind of a lot. I would argue the true number is more like this 300 here once you factor out some re reusable parts that I'll probably just publish separately. So those you won't have to write the next time you make a collaborative app. And this is, they're in this GitHub repo here. I'll put a link at the end. And yeah, 
So now let's see this in action. So here you might recognize from the third slide or so, this is our collaborative recipe book. And if I enter something in here, I've sort of suggestively opened this in two windows at once. And we can indeed see that once I update one of the windows, the changes show up the other one. And I can change three cups of chicken, change the pie crust to a count instead of a cup. And these will eventually show up on the other side. Um, it's a bit slow because even though these tabs are on the same computer, I am using a server just to demonstrate that this really is internet connected. They could equally well be very far apart. It would still work. Um, and it's going through the 4G signal on my phone, so it's a bit slow. But anyway, yeah, that's our collaborative recipe book. Now you have a place where you know, the whole family can compile their secret family recipes together, edit them no matter how far apart they are. And yeah, I think the coolest thing about this is the thing that's kind of hard to see, the fact that I was able to deploy this recipe book just by pushing a file to GitHub, not having to do any extra effort. All the networking instead is handled by this group chat, which is happening in Matrix's element client. You can see if I type a message on the left, it shows up on the right. So this is just a normal group chat, but it has the ability to plug in arbitrary apps and send messages through the group chat. And I use Matrix to do this. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's basically, it's like a group chat protocol that's more of an open standard as opposed to some monolithic platform like WhatsApp. That means anyone can write a server, anyone can write a client, and they all interoperate together, just like with email. So it's a bit, like a, a bit more open than what you're used to. Um, yeah, and this means that you know, if my recipe app becomes very popular, I don't have to worry about scaling. It's matrix who has to scale. I just have to keep that file up on GitHub for other people to use. Okay. Um, now, one thing I had promised in the talk abstract was to show you end-to-end -end encrypted collaboration. We're actually doing that already. Um, it's a bit small to see here, but this gray box says encryption enabled messages in this room are end-to-end -end encrypted. So everything that's being sent through the matrix group chat is encrypted on the one client and then sent in encrypted form through the network, decrypted by my collaborators. So that means anything I type into this app is effectively secret. For instance, I could type, you know, like my email password is hunter2, okay? I don't have to worry that some server admin or like a, a network adversary somewhere, yeah, I saw someone taking a picture of that, uh, is, um, is gonna look at this password and you know, use it to hack me or whatever. The only people who can see this are me and my collaborators. Um, well, of course, also everyone here. So get rid of that, okay. So that's end-to-end -end encrypted collaboration. Maybe the recipe book is a bit of a silly example, but you can imagine this is useful for things like you know, rich text editors. If you want to use Google Docs, but you don't trust Google with your data because it's sensitive or for legal compliance reasons, then you can use an end-to-end -end encrypted network host like this instead. Okay, that's one demo. I had also promised to demo LAN or server-free collaboration. Um, and again, this is possible using CRDTs because they don't care about message order. It's okay if like, you know, two people sync up now and they sync up with everyone else later. So to demonstrate that, I am going to disconnect the 4G on my phone. Now my laptop's connected to my phone as a hotspot so they can talk to each other, but we're cut off from the rest of the internet. And if we're extremely lucky, I'll be able to use my phone to connect directly to this app. Let's see. Yeah, it's a bit flaky sometime. I'm using this lib peer-to-peer, -peer, which I think is a bit of an alpha state. Um, hmm. Yeah, it doesn't look like this is working for now. Okay, this was working when I tried it 10 minutes ago. I don't know what's happening, but let's just open this app in two windows on my laptop. Wait for it. Okay. And now you can see this is a lot snappier than it was before when I was using Matrix to do the collaboration. That's because it's just sending messages through the through local host instead of all the way to a server and back. Uh, but in principle, this would work if you had two different computers on a LAN. I just don't have two computers here right now. They would find each other automatically using lib peer to peers multicast DNS plugin. And what that means is that you can continue collaborating even if you know you're on a plane with some other people 
or maybe you're out doing field work somewhere, you don't have a connection to the broader internet, but you can still talk to each other, um, and things will just work how you expect them to. And as a final demo, we don't just have this silly little recipe app, you can make more complicated things too. Um, I mean, it's a bit rough around the edges because I don't know CSS, but um, so this is a demo that sort of incorporates like a shared whiteboard, shared notes that have rich text in them, um, and also you can plug in arbitrary other collaborative apps. So here I'm doing uh, something that I've seen my fiance use. It's like a horse gene editor. You can click on the genes and see what the horse would look like if you change them. It's just like a, it's a silly niche thing. You can make you know, family trees out of it, see what the horses are gonna look like. I use it as an example because it's, it's such a specific thing. I wouldn't expect someone to go to all the trouble of making a platform just to deploy this app as a collaborative version. But with Collabs, because we outsource the network to you know, Matrix or other sources, we can just take the single user version of this app and um, add collaboration to it fairly easily. And indeed, the original version of this app, it comes from an artist named Jennifer Hoffman who painted all these pretty pictures and put it on our web page as just a static page with HTML and JavaScript, left it there for 10 years or so. I just took a weekend to download it and turn it into using Collabs. Okay. Um, so that's the demos. Yeah, so hopefully I've shown you that at least in principle it is possible to make these collaborative apps that get you know, the good properties for both developers and users and in principle could be open source as well. So for the rest of the talk, I wanna give a bit more detail about our library. In particular, try to justify you, to you why are we making a new CRDT library and why might you consider using it instead of one of the alternatives. Um, because if you're familiar with CRDTs, you might object and say like, well, CRDTs have been around for a long time, there's already implementations, why do we need a new one? Okay. So yeah, you're right that CRDTs have been around for a while, in theory, since around 2008, maybe even earlier in practice. We've seen NoSQL data stores like React and Bloom around 2014. More recently, YGS and Automerge do the same sort of like local first, peer-to-peer -peer ready collaboration in the browser using CRDTs. And there's other collaboration libraries that happen, to those use the server though. Um, and basically the idea is that the, that the special properties of collabs are these three things. So it's flexible and extensible, it's composable, and when you use it, you can keep your, your, your local, for your original single user data model and type safety. And I'll go over what all these means on the next few slides. Okay, first off, flexible and extensible. By that I mean that you can add new types to the library. So if you're using collabs in an app and you need some data structure that we don't have yet, you can just implement it yourself, use it within your app, maybe publish it as a third party extension. So you're not stuck just with the things that we've happened to implement it. Even though this might sound obvious for like a collections data structures library, it's a bit tricky to do with replicated data structures. Um, and it's actually a somewhat rare feature that you can add new collaborative data types without forking the library and changing its source code. This is useful because you know maybe tomorrow someone will come out with a cool new CRDT algorithm, like this paper by Martin Kleppman on moving elements and list CRDTs. It lets you do useful things like you know if we were to move ingredients in the recipe app while someone else was editing the ingredients text, you wanna keep both of these changes instead of just destroying one or making a copy of things or whatever. So that's what this paper does. So yeah, if you wanted to, wanted to, you could add this to the library. Um, yeah, and more generally, this flexibility means that the library can sort of age gracefully. We're not stuck with the CRDTs of today. Even if you know I don't maintain the library very much and add new types to it, other people can keep contributing. So now this paper, it didn't come out tomorrow. It came out about a year and a half ago at PAPOC 2020. So um, we've already implemented within the library. So sorry, if you were planning on going home and implementing this tonight, we sort of beat you to the punch there. Um, as far as I'm aware, we're the only library to have included this type so far. I haven't heard of any other implementations yet. Anyway, hopefully that'll be less of a problem in the future. Um, okay, so yeah, I've told you you can add new types, but now you might be objecting and saying like, wait, I've heard CRDTs are really hard. I don't wanna have to write my own types. That's for distributed systems experts, maybe people with a math background because they have to prove correctness and all that. So the good news is that we also provide composition techniques that make it easier to build new collaborative data structures than just building them from scratch. Of course, you can build them from scratch, but if you use these techniques instead, 
then you can re um, avoid repeating yourself, and also their correctness property is composed too. So if you start with two com correct things and glue them together, as long as you follow the rules, you'll still get like eventual consistency and convergence and all that. So for example, uh, when I say composition, I'm thinking of things like this. This is from the paper I mentioned on the last slide. Basically, the way Martin describes this movable list is to say, instead of using a list directly, we are going to represent the state as a collaborative set, this AW set here, and it's going to contain pairs, value, comma, position, where the position is something that you can mutate. And you mutate, you mutate it using a last writer wins register, which means just like if two people try to move the thing at the same time, it'll pick one based on wall clock time. Okay, so yeah, this is a, this is a very elegant description um, by Martin, and we can implement it in our library basically by directly translating this compositional construction. So this isn't the actual code, this is more like a summary of how we implemented it, but basically you have your collaborative set, it's made of list entries, oh, I guess I should say list entry in the class in the bottom there. Um, but anyway, each entry is made of the value and the position register, and then you also have this position source object, which does the list part of things of like giving you new positions and sorting them. Um, so this is really nice. First off, the correctness follows rather quickly. Like this collaborative set is never going to be different on two users' devices. They're always going to see the same values. We don't have to worry about things diverging there. And also we get to reuse the existing implementation, like this um, dense local list class that probably gave me the most trouble out of any class in the whole library, so I'm really glad I don't have to implement it again. Okay, that was composition. Uh, but now if looking at this, I think Martin almost makes it sound too easy to implement, and then you're looking at our source code, you're saying, oh, you haven't done anything interesting, we just glued a set and a dense local list together by putting them next to each other. That's not a very exciting composition. Okay, maybe that's true, but you can do more exciting compositions as well. And to describe one of those, I am going to set a scenario. So the scenario is, it's Christmas Eve, you wanna make gingerbread cookies for Santa, okay? You pull up your family shared recipe book and you see the gingerbread cookie recipe, it starts with three cups of flour, two eggs, half a teaspoon of baking powder, etc. Okay, so you're looking at that and you think, okay, um, I also want some cookies for myself, not just some for Santa, so I'm going to double the recipe. We have a scale recipe button that lets you do this really easily. So now it has six cups of flour, four eggs, one teaspoon of baking powder. Meanwhile, your cousin has had the same idea. They pull up their copy of the shared recipe book, you know, a thousand miles away, and they think instead of making the cookies as is, they're going to reduce the flour a little bit, so they're a bit less cakey. So they set flour to 2.8 cups. And now, for whatever reason, the internet's kind of flaky right now. You and your cousin don't immediately sync up, which is fine. And then later, the, um, yeah, later you sync up, the recipes converge, and you know, everything, your, your two views will converge. So now you're making the recipe, you put in your four eggs, your one teaspoon of baking powder, all the other doubled ingredients. You get to flour, it says 2.8 cups. Okay, you add 2.8 cups of flour, and then you bake the cookies, and they'll probably come out looking something like this. Uh, kind of a gooey mess. I haven't tried this, so I don't know for sure, but basically they've got half as much flour as they're supposed to. Here we've got this 2.8 cups of flour. Um, and why did this happen? Well, in this, this hypothetical scenario, basically whatever collaborative data structures library you've chosen is it saw that someone set flour to six cups, someone else set flour to 2.8 cups, but it didn't really assign any meaning to the fact that you doubled the recipe. It's just using a last writer wins register for these, so then, when it sees this conflict, it picks one arbitrarily. It, it happened to pick your cousin's change, which is a bit unlucky for you. Okay, so let's see what happens if we do something fancier. So how could we have prevented this accident? I'm going to, oops, go to another demo here. So here we've got the start of this gingerbread recipe. There's like 10 more ingredients that aren't shown here. And I'm going to use these debug controls to connect the one window from the internet. So the left window is us. We're gonna double the recipe. Okay. The right window is our cousin. We're gonna change, decrease the flour just a little bit. Okay. And now when we connect things, you should see that the flour has gone to 5.6 cups. Um, this is basically what the users is going to intuitively expect, right? We've doubled the recipe. It was also changed a little bit. So we should double that change. Okay. Um, so under the hood, this is using a 
composition technique called the semi-direct product, which I wrote about in a paper with Heather and Chris Micklejohn at ICFP last year. So back then it was a theoretical, theoretical construction we've implemented within the library. Um, just for, sort of the point of the library to start off with is we wanted to implement the semi-direct product. And then we saw that the API we had created was really terrible. So we thought, how can we improve this? Just kind of went from there. Um, yeah, basically the semi-direct product, it lets you take two sets of operations on the same state and combine them under certain conditions um, in a way that makes sense. So for instance, here we've combined the doubling operation and the set operation on a register in the way that makes intuitive sense. Okay, so that's composition. And the last special property of our library is that you can keep your data model and its type safety. So here on the left, um, hopefully you can read it, I have the class ingredient from the original single user recipe up, or recipe app. You can see it's made of you know, the text, the amount, the units, the constructor sets values. Then to make this collaborative, the first step is we want to replace object with collaborative object in the ingredient class, okay. And then we replace each of these instance fields which is with its collaborative version. Um, you know, string becomes ctext, et cetera. But all these instance fields, they're still typed, right? If you ask the last writer wins register of type unit for its value, it's gonna be a unit. And then we have to do some boilerplate in the constructor, some more boilerplate. Um, this is basically just telling the library like, hey, these types exist, you should connect them to the, the network. And the nice thing here is that we still have a class, we still have types, those are both nice. We can still use encapsulation and things like this. Um, and again, this might seem sort of obvious for a, a collections library that you would get these properties, but actually it's, um, it's sort of rare when using CRDTs because you know, I guess the, the existing libraries, they tend to look more like NoSQL data stores where you know you have a store, you put some data in it as JSON or as unstructured maps and lists. Then when you get, back, get it back out again, you've kind of forgotten that structure. So whereas in our library, we try to let you use classes. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's it. I think I talked a bit too fast, so we'll have lots of time for questions. Um, that's our library collabs. You can download it on NPM, look at the source code on GitHub. Um, all the demos I showed today, there's GitHub repos, they're linked on my personal website, which you can find in the talk description page. Um, and I just finally, I'd like to acknowledge um, all the students who have worked on the library over the past year or so. They've been helping out with some of the core stuff, looking at the API, um, working on demos that got integrated into some of the stuff you saw today. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's it, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so we haven't looked into that yet. I think in theory it should be possible using the same sort of ideas like in Google protobufs, where you know you would have um, handlers would like ignore fields they don't recognize, or you know in particular if you have like an object and it sees a message for some instance field it doesn't know about, it'll just ignore it. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something we want to look at in the future. Yeah, the question was to show how the gingerbread example is implemented to find the right repo. Nice to And it's this class here. Let's see. So first we have to define the multiplication part, which is this mult number. Um, so that's like a primitive thing where you just like send messages, but it's very simple. You just, you know, send the number as a byte array, then on the other side, you multiply your value by that number. So that's one component. The other component is the last writer wins register, which comes built into the library. And then to combine these, let's see. How can I distill this? You basically, so we make a register whose value is a, a mult number, so like a mutable number that you can multiply. And whenever you set the value, it's, it becomes a new mult number that you can multiply. Um, and then when you multiply it, there's two things that happen. First, you multiply all the numbers that you know about, and then you also use a semi-direct product to um, basically tell you, are there any new numbers that appeared concurrently to the multiplication? You multiply those as well. So that happens like, um, in here, you basically send a message saying like, everyone please multiply um, all the numbers you know about where they happen concurrently. Yeah, it's a bit hard to show in code like this. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, so the question was, do we see a path to making, letting the users define how to resolve conflicts? Um, I'm not sure, this isn't something I've thought about. I guess it is tricky because there are still correctness guarantees you have to maintain. Like sometimes users want, might want something to happen in the face of conflicts that's just like it doesn't make sense mathematically. Um, yeah, I guess that would be the ideal though if you could just you know, look at a thing and say this is what I expect to happen, make it happen. Um, I would like the like these things. Yeah. Let's see. So there's two pieces here. There. So this is the internal app. Um, the main thing you do to set up the collaboration. So at the bottom, you have to get a runtime from a library somehow, just like the entry point. Then you register your data types, which appear up top. Um, so this isn't actually connected to the network at all. The network, instead this is sort of like a generic network agnostic app. You plug this into a different thing which then um, talks to matrix or like the network of your choosing. Um, I can try to find that if you want. It'd be in a different folder though. Oops. It's hard when it's so large. Um, yeah, so this is an example like how to talk to matrix. We have this interface you have to implement that's a broadcast network. And then when you ask to send a message, it just talks to the, this API put out by a matrix, which is like how to talk to their group chat. You just pipe the message through. Um, and then there's some like, you know, set up around this. Oh, if you want to know about the peer-to-peer the -peer demo, that's using libp2p. Um, the, the clients find each other using multicast DNS and then establish GCP connections and just gossip over those. Uh, yeah, the question was, is it, make it it's possible to make a default to local area network? Um, yeah, I think the, the, the demo as it's set up now, it should just work if you're on a local area network where you know peer-to-peer -peer connections aren't banned. It's like a normal home network. Um, that should just work. Yeah, here I was trying to use the phone hotspot because I doubt the conference Wi-Fi would let me make peer-to-peer -peer connections. But yeah, I guess one of the, and more generally, one of the things we haven't done is to make like, you know, a, a desktop app or browser app that sort of incorporates all possible networks and handles, you know, retrying messages and stuff like that. That would be something that would be really useful, especially if you could make it like comprehensible to non-technical users of like, you know, how to choose your network and stuff like that. Um, I guess our focus is more on like making that possible. Uh, what's next? That's a good question. I guess there's a lot of like stuff to clean up, just like technical deck to take care of. Take care of. Um, yeah, I remember I had something I was thinking of doing next. Oh yeah, I guess one thing. Yeah, just features to make it like more actually useful. I still consider this in like an alpha state. So for example, we have the ability to save the state of an app, like including all the stuff you need to continue collaborating. We just haven't actually integrated into the demos and have them actually you know, save the state to a file occasionally and load it back later. That's probably the next thing. Yeah, I think it should be pretty flexible. I know, um, I think both auto merge and YGS, or maybe just auto merge, uh, the, some other libraries that do similar things, they're originally written in JavaScript. They've been converting to Rust and trying to use WebAssembly to run it that way. Um, yeah, it's basically it's just data structures passing messages over the network. Yeah, if that's it, then I guess. Thank you.